Hello, distinguished guests, and welcome to Aquarium Bright. Here, you will get to see the most dangerous sea and ocean creatures. But don't let what I said mislead you. It's very well possible for you to come across one of these underwater animals during a walk on the beach. So, take a look at them carefully now, and you might just avoid a disaster. Is it fish or is it stone? What you're looking at is commonly known as the stonefish, but its fancier names include the Dornorn and the Sinansia. If you're into diving and observing the underwater, you might already have come across one without noticing. Its appearance makes it almost impossible to distinguish it from a real stone due to its gray coloration and mottled appearance especially if you're wearing fogged snorkel goggles. So you better pay attention because otherwise, the consequences can be unfortunate since stonefish are the most venomous fish known. Although some types of stonefishes are known to live in rivers, and most of them are found in coral reefs near the tropical Pacific and Indian Oceans. Their needle-like dorsal fin spines stick up when they're disturbed or threatened and inject the poison they contain. The most common reason why stonefish stings occur is swimmers stepping on them without realizing it. However, you don't need to be in the water to get stung. Since they can survive out of the water for up to 24 hours, you'll have to watch where you step when you're at the beach as well. Those who got stung by stonefish describe their experience to be extremely distressing. Their venom can result in infection, and in some cases, it is known to cause shock and paralysis. It might come as a bit of a shock, but despite its bad reputation, stonefish is edible if it's prepared properly. When the fish is heated, its venom breaks down. And if the dorsal fins, which are the main source of its venom, are removed, raw stonefish is served as part of sashimi too. This creature might look like it came out of a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. Say hello to the blue-ringed octopuses. Don't be deceived by their small size, which can range between 5 to 8 inches, including their arms, because they're packed with venom to cause great damage to as many as 26 people within minutes. Just like stonefishes, blue-ringed octopuses are found in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Japan to Australia. They typically live on coral reefs and rocky areas of the seafloor. Some may also be found in tide pools, seagrass, and algal beds. Blue-ringed octopuses are not aggressive in nature. When they're not seeking food such as crabs or shrimps, or searching for a mate, they often hide in marine debris, shells, or crevices. It's only if they're provoked, cornered, or handled that they get dangerous to humans. When they're threatened, they turn bright yellow, or blue iridescent rings appear all over their body as a warning display towards the potential predators. Their bites usually come unnoticed, so you might not be able to realize you're bitten until it's too late. The venom of a blue-ringed octopus can cause dizziness and loss of senses and motor skills, and ultimately, paralysis. So, better try to keep your hands to yourself and back away in a hurry if you see one. Nope, it's not a flower bouquet, so don't try to pick and smell one of those pink tube-like things. What's standing before your eyes is a marine animal called a flower urchin. It may look gorgeous, but don't let the looks deceive you. It was named the most dangerous sea urchin in the 2014 Guinness World Records. Flower urchins inhabit the tropical areas of the Indo-West Pacific and are found among coral reefs, rocks, sand, and seagrass beds at depths of 0 to 295 feet. The most noticeable feature of them is their pedicularia, which are claw-shaped defensive organs that are also found in sea stars. What makes flower urchins differ from any other sea urchin is the fact that their pedicularia is, as the name suggests, flower-like and usually pinkish-white to yellowish-white in color, with a central purple dot. Hidden underneath those flowers, they possess short and blunt spines. Although many sea urchins deliver their venom through such spines, flower urchins deliver their venom through their pedicularia, or flowers. If they're undisturbed, the tips of these flowers are usually expanded into round, cup-like shapes. On their surface, they possess tiny sensors with which they can detect threats. And once they contact such threats, these flowers immediately snap shut and start injecting venom. What's weird is that the little claws of the flowers can sometimes break off from their stalks, stick to the point of contact, and continue injecting venom for hours into whoever touched it. 
Yeesh. Looks like a giant puddle of melted strawberry ice cream, right? You wish. It's a lion's mane jellyfish, which is also called giant jellyfish, arctic red jellyfish, or hairy jelly. They're known to prefer cool water. That's why they can mostly be found in the Arctic, northern Atlantic, and northern Pacific Oceans. But it's possible to spot them around the British Isles or in the Scandinavian waters too. Lion's mane jellyfish are one of the largest known species of jellyfish. They get their name from their long, flowing hair-like tentacles and can reach lengths up to 10 feet. And although the average bell diameter of a lion's mane jellyfish is around 20 inches, they can sometimes attain a diameter of over 7 feet. The largest lion's mane jellyfish recorded was seen in 1865 off the coast of Massachusetts. It was measured to have tentacles around 125 feet long and a diameter of 7 feet. To help you picture it, this is longer than a blue whale. Lion's mane jellyfish hunt by extending their tentacles outward and creating a trap to catch their food. Since they have around 1,200 stinging tentacles, the fish would have to be extremely lucky to be able to escape them. The sting of a lion's mane jellyfish is usually not life-threatening, but you would still want to avoid swimming into its tentacles because it can be very painful to humans. And if you see one washed up on the beach, better not touch it because it can still deliver a sting long after they've been on the shore. Fun fact, the lion's mane jellyfish appears in the Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of the Lion's Mane, as a suspect. But don't worry, we won't give you any spoilers. The last marine animal you're seeing now is a sea snake. And yes, they are different from eels. There are 69 identified species of sea snakes. Most of them can be found in the tropical and subtropical waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And they have been around for millions of years. To make things easier, scientists have separated all different species of sea snakes into two categories, true sea snakes and sea crates. Whereas true sea snakes spend almost all their time at sea, sea crates can spend some time on land as well. If you see a snake on the beach, you can tell whether it's a land or sea snake by looking at its tail. If it's paddle-like, then that's a sea snake you got there, but make sure to keep your distance in both cases. All sea snakes need to surface regularly to breathe since they have no gills. That's why you can come across one while swimming. If that happens, you better swim away as fast as you can because most sea snakes have more venom than the average cobra or rattlesnake. However, since they only attack if provoked, bites are quite rare. One more cool fact about sea snakes, they are the only reptiles to give birth in the oceans. The majority of sea snakes keep the eggs within themselves and give birth to nearly fully formed snakes while swimming. That's except for the yellow-lipped sea crate though. They come onto land to lay eggs of their little ones. Remember the stonefish from the beginning of our tour? They're hunted by sea snakes. Blame the food chain. Check this out. There's a giant tornado heading towards you, and it's so fast. These twisters can move at crazy speeds of more than 250 miles per hour. Plus, they can carve a pathway 50 miles long and a mile wide. Sometimes you can see them coming clearly, while in some cases, low-hanging clouds or rain can hide them, so they sneak up on you and you don't even see them. And in most cases, a tornado can develop so fast that no one can even warn you in time if it's already too close. And now, this insane storm is really close. Maybe you have a couple of minutes to get somewhere safe. Do you have a basement? Go hide. Or maybe, I know this is a crazy idea, but what do you think about going inside a tornado to check what it would be like? Now, some tornadoes appear as rope-like swirls, while others have wide clouds in the shape of a funnel. And here's the second one, right before you. Look at these whirling winds born in a thunderstorm. They extend down from it to the ground. Many times, hail joins the party too. The U.S. itself has something like a thousand tornadoes per year. Texas holds the record with about 120 tornadoes per year, a record not to be proud of. But you'll generally see most twisters in Tornado Alley, which is a stretch of land in the Midwestern part of the U.S. They develop when warm, moist air coming from Mexico meets cool, dry air from Canada. These two clash and turn into a powerful storm that at some point can spawn tornadoes. 
and you'll see most tornadoes there between April and June. Though lately, some have come even in December. They can range from a regular dust storm to an incredibly powerful force that can carry away cars, large trees, and even houses. But this is a unique chance. You've never been this close, right? Plus, it's a gigantic one. You don't often get to see such a big one. Okay, ready then? It's getting closer. You feel the wind getting stronger while tossing dirt and debris in your face. You close your eyes and whoosh! You're inside, and it's crazy! Vicious winds are hurling and spinning you around. They're lifting you up at the same time. Feeling dizzy? Feeling like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz? Now may be a good time to check what's really happening to you while inside swirling with winds and… Oh wait! Is that your neighbor's motorcycle spinning together with you? Hope it'll stay that far away. Now, let's take a moment to catch up. Being in the middle of a raging tornado is actually something you might survive. But I won't lie to you, it won't be easy. The first thing you'd sense would likely be the temperature changes. Inside this crazy twister, it can be 36 degrees colder than outside of it. That's because the center of the tornado funnel spins all the time. All that funneling makes the inside of the vortex way colder, and it makes the air way thinner than you used to. The air would be 20% less dense than, for example, what you would find at high altitudes. Now, I hope you're not planning to stay there for too long. Disclaimer here, the atmospheric pressure inside this swirling vortex is so low that your lungs won't be able to extract <laughs> enough oxygen. Now, to give you a perspective of all this, breathing inside a tornado is like trying to get some air at an altitude of 26,000 feet. That's a pro level, similar to climbing Everest. So yeah, you'll need some help just to be able to take a regular breath. In short, you'll probably pass out after only a couple of minutes. But don't worry, I brought you this special mask, so breathing is not a problem anymore. Hey, did you notice how smooth the airflow from the inside is? Some storm watchers ended up inside a tornado. Later, they said it all looked so chaotic with all those raging clouds and wind swirling around. But from the inside, the air is surprisingly smooth. But that doesn't mean you'll get a peaceful ride because of it. And it's not a solo party in that thing. The neighbor's motorcycle is not the only thing you'll see there. Wood, bricks, glass, maybe even cars, cows, motorhomes, bricks, roofs, and other big objects. You'd be pretty lucky if nothing crashes into you in all that chaos. With all that debris that's swirling at, for instance, 310 miles per hour, you can hardly avoid it. But let's just say a miracle happens and you got through it. Now you're really dizzy, and you're just wondering when all of this is going to be over and if you're even going to be able to come out of this gigantic tornado. Well, the tornado will eventually slow down. It happens because cool air enters the twister. Just because things are settling down, it doesn't mean you can relax. Well, your stomach can <laughs> since all that crazy swirling is done, but the tornado will drop you from whatever height you're on when it stops. If you're somewhere in the countryside, there might be some soft bale of hay to break your fall. Oh wait, we're talking about a twister that's probably more than 45,000 feet tall, so that won't work. I hope you brought your parachute, because now would be a good time to pop it. Nope. Hey, don't worry. I'm all about happy endings, so I'll help you out. Here you go. And now you're slowing down, enjoying the view, if you even see anything around you from all that dizziness. How come there are clear sunlit skies from your left, you may wonder? It's not unusual. Tornadoes often form near the edge of a thunderstorm. It's like a border between two different worlds. And it wasn't even windy. Plus, the air was very still before it hit, right? Well, that's common too. Okay, I think you know this kind of scenario is impossible in reality. So it would be best to find a safe spot quickly if a tornado was close by. Use your underground shelter first. And if you don't have one, your basement could be the next best choice. Prepare ahead of time with a battery-operated TV or radio, together with fresh batteries, or a device with internet to be able to hear the latest updates on the tornado. Include some non-perishable food, water, and other essentials prepared too. As it turns out, some people really were picked up by tornadoes, and they managed to go through it. A tornado actually dropped them a few hundred feet away without a scratch. Hey, I'd say that's a whole lot of bother just to save some bucks on Uber. 
But you can't have a guarantee you'll be safe or where you'll end up. It would be incredibly hard to get out of one of those big and fierce ones, though, like supercells. They fall into the category of the strongest type of storms, mostly thunderstorms. And imagine falling into water spouts. Those could be fine, though, at least the beginning, because they're weak and they form over warm water. So they could be like a part of your spa day, at least until they move inland and turn into a real tornado. Now, dust devils wouldn't be that pleasant. They're not that big, but we're talking about columns of air that rotate at large speeds. And you can easily see them because of all that dirt and dust they pick up, which is why you need glasses for that. Whoops, wait, I forgot that, so I can't help you this time. But if it makes you feel any better, they're not associated with thunderstorms. Hmm, don't know why that would make anyone feel better when I think about it. But if you're willing to jump into a fire tornado, I'll find you a special suit that will keep you safe while spinning through smoke, gas, and flames. I promise! Columns here are narrow, and they rise vertically into the air, similar to a dust devil. Of course, the heat is crazy. And as updrafts are becoming stronger, and if there's enough dry fuel, a fire whirl is turning into a real fire tornado that extends from the ground up to the cloud, moving incredibly fast. Okay, let's stop now. I'm pretty dizzy. Imagine you're hanging out somewhere in the forests of Australia. You're thirsty, so you go to the nearest stream. Suddenly, you feel that you have a runny nose. It's strange because you're perfectly healthy. You stop and wait. A few seconds pass. Your nose is itching. A few minutes pass. Your eyes are watering. Your throat is going crazy. You can't breathe freely. And you're constantly sneezing. It seems you're breathing poisoned air. But what's poisoning it? The smallest particles of the most dangerous plant in the world are flying around you. It's called Gimpy Gimpy. There it is. It looks ordinary. A small bush with green stems and leaves. The closer you come, the worse you're feeling. You need more air, and your skin is turning red. It <coughs> physically hurts you to be here. You may lose consciousness if you stay here for a little bit more. Do you know what will happen if you touch this plant? Well, it will feel like red-hot needles penetrating your skin. And even <coughs> if you run away as far as possible from here right now, the pain will not subside. The effects of the sting will last for several hours. Days will pass, and the pain will remain. Weeks and months will pass, but you'll still feel it. You can wash the touch area with cold water and soap, but this won't help a lot. It might not go away for several years. And all those tiny plant hairs that penetrated your skin can stay with you forever. The toxicity of Gimpy Gimpy is so high that even if you tear off one leaf and touch it after a year, it will still cause damage to your body. The bad news is that this plant is hard to spot. You can easily confuse it with burdock or nettle. Just imagine what will happen if someone falls into the bush. Its distinctive feature is a thin layer of fluff on each leaf. But be careful! This fluff consists of thousands of poisonous hairs. They also fly around the plant, so it's dangerous to be here without a gas mask. An ordinary medical mask won't help here, since the hairs can get through the fabric. The good news is, there aren't many of them around the world, and people usually put warning signs near them. This bad guy grows in Australia. Gold miners discovered this plant in 1860, near the town of Gympie. And something is telling me it wasn't the happiest discovery. Even now, Gimpy Gimpy poses a serious danger to loggers and tourists. You may accidentally touch it with your hand. One touch is enough to make you lose your working capacity for several weeks. In some cases, the affected area continues to hurt for decades. One man fell into the bush and lost his mind because of the pain. People compare a Gimpy Gimpy sting with a bite of 30 wasps at the same time. And you won't know how to get rid of it. One guy experienced an unpleasant feeling every time he took a shower for two years after touching this plant. If you want to study it, you need to wear a protective suit and a gas mask. There should be no open areas on your body. Tuck your pant legs into your boots, put on protective gloves, and move out into the forest. It grows on the edge, next to streams. Gimpy Gimpy is one of the six species of poisonous trees native to Australia. 
They love the sun and the vegetation around them. Every hair on the surface of the leaf is poisoned. When it contacts any surface, it opens and sprays a burning toxin. Then, the pain increases and the skin turns red. The duration of the effect depends on the number of hairs that penetrate your body. After a few years, you can put pressure on the bite site and feel the hairs are still there. There's no antidote because scientists still don't know what the toxic poison's components are. All they know is that the poison effect lasts a very long time, several years. It can withstand cold and hot temperatures. Water only enhances its effect. Botanical samples of this plant in laboratories are still dangerous, despite scientists keeping them for several years. After you have passed by Gimpy Gimpy, don't forget to disinfect yourself. Carefully remove clothes, shoes, masks, and glasses. Put a protective suit in the washing machine and wash everything else well. Tiny hairs can be in your pants or the sleeves of your jacket, so be careful. This toxicity makes Gimpy Gimpy the most protected plant in the world. But wait, what's that? Do you see these little holes on its leaves? It seems that someone is eating it. These are the usual nocturnal beetle species. They can devour Gimpy Gimpy all day long, as the poisonous hairs can't harm them. These bugs just don't care. Gimpy Gimpy is the perfect lunch, as no one can disturb these beetles while they're sitting on this plant. And yes, all the animals living nearby know that it's better not to get close to it. But there's one mammal that is not afraid of Gimpy Gimpy. It's a red-legged patamelon. It looks like a little kangaroo and loves to eat the Gimpy Gimpy leaves. Scientists still don't know what exactly protects this animal from toxic hairs. We know almost all the places where this plant grows. People mark them with signs. If you see one, just don't go there. Gimpy Gimpy is a terrible plant, but how about a plant that can take over the whole world and destroy all the crops? It doesn't need favorable conditions for growth. It can survive in the rain, in arid places under the scorching sun, at low and high temperatures. It's called the giant hogweed. If the seed of this plant gets into a vegetable bed or a wheat field, the plant will displace all competitors in a few weeks. The wind can blow on the giant hogweed seeds and spread them further to the nearest territories. This plant can worsen ecosystems around the world. It grows faster than people manage to destroy it. If you spray poison on the leaves, it doesn't even care. If you let parasitic beetles into giant hogweed territory, it doesn't care either. It multiplies very fast and lives longer than many plants. The giant hogweed can reach the height of a one-story huh? house and go deep underground with its roots. It's also dangerous to touch it with your hands. It can turn your skin red, and it won't feel good to say the least. That's how it's making it so hard to fight against it. This poison destroys any plants, bushes, and flowers nearby. Scientists still can't create an effective poison to combat this green monster. No beetles feed on it. That's why the giant hogweed is one of the most dangerous plants in the world. It simply has no enemies in nature. But scientists are sure that evolution will create some creatures capable of destroying the giant hogweed. It can be small bugs or parasitic bacteria. But until that happens, people have to fight this beast on their own. They spend millions of dollars trying to destroy the plant, but it doesn't always work out. You can burn a field, but if one seed remains, it will quickly grow on the scorched ground. You've seen some of the most dangerous plants in the world. But what about trees? A manchineal tree grows in Florida. Its trunk secretes toxic juice that's dangerous for your skin, but it gets much worse during the rain. When water falls on the bark, it mixes with the poison. Then, these poison drops can bounce off the tree and get on your skin. Leaves and fruits also have this toxin, so never hide under this tree in bad weather. Mushrooms, shrubs, and flowers don't grow near this tree either. Animals never come close to it. Birds never sit on its branches. Manchineal trees are resistant to water and high temperatures. Never try to burn it. The smoke released during combustion is toxic and dangerous to your eyes. The locals mark this tree with red circles. Who do you think will win? A hungry grizzly or a ripe berry? An angry tiger or a beautiful flower? A huge python or a green bush? The answer's not so obvious. 
Now you'll see who really controls the jungle and forests. Meet the most dangerous plants on Earth. This is the water hemlock. It grows in North America in swampy areas of fields and meadows. Also, you can find this plant on the shores of rivers and streams. It seems harmless, but it's one of the most poisonous plants in the U.S. Water hemlock toxins can cause critical damage to an adult in 15 minutes, but only if you swallow it. Many people mistakenly confuse it with artichoke, celery, and anise. Despite the dangerous poison, water hemlock is used to cure migraines and intestinal diseases. This plant has caused a lot of damage to livestock. White snake root grows in fields and pastures. When a cow bites it, the plant releases a fat-soluble toxin. This poison gets not only inside the animal, but also into the milk. Young calves who drink the milk also become infected. Poisoned milk is also dangerous for people. The problem is that this plant, native to North America, is one of the longest-lived autumn flowers. Now in modern farms, the poison of this plant is not so dangerous. But on small private pastures, white snake root is the number one danger. We all know two kinds of beans, the ones we eat and the ones that Jack used to get to the realm of giants. In addition to them, there are poisonous ones. These are called castor beans. They contain one of the most dangerous toxins in the world, ricin. As soon as it enters your body, it blocks the production of proteins necessary for life. Without these proteins, your cells stop functioning. The more cells are destroyed, the more your body suffers. The castor bean releases ricin when squeezed. Several beans can cause dehydration, weakness, hallucinations, seizures, and other problems. About seven beans are enough to cause critical damage. So remember what they look like and never touch them if you see them in the woods. One of the most beautiful plants on the planet is also one of the most dangerous. This is oleander. Everything is poisonous in it. The stem, the root, and the pink flower. Even a tiny piece of this plant can lead to severe poisoning. It doesn't need to get inside your stomach to create severe problems. Just a little touch to the juice of the flower causes allergies. And don't try to burn it, as the smoke of a burning oleander has toxic effects too. And now, the most dangerous plant in the world. One touch of it will hurt you for several years. Or you may feel the consequences all your life. The Gimpy Gimpy plant, also called the Queensland Stinger, looks like an ordinary burdock bush. It doesn't look like anything poisonous at all. But if you stand next to this plant, you'll feel suffocation and watery eyes. There are thousands of tiny poisonous hairs on the leaves of this flower. They're so light, they can hang in the air and spread by the wind. So you should put on a gas mask if you want to look at the plant. But if you lightly touch Gimpy Gimpy, you're in big trouble. Some compare one Gimpy Gimpy sting to 30 wasp stings at the same time. Poisonous hairs easily penetrate under your skin and cause irritation and pain. The problem is that you can't pull them out. Wash with soap and water, use some disinfecting ointment, and you'll see that the situation is only worsening. The hairs can't be pulled out of there. They sit there, releasing toxins and driving you crazy. There's no antidote because scientists still don't know what components the toxin consists of. It can withstand cold and hot temperatures. Unpleasant sensations can last for several hours, days, or even months. People who touched the plant said that the pain from the sting returned even after a few years. But if it's impossible to get rid of the hairs, then the only way out is to wait for them to lose their toxicity. But there's another problem here. You can tear off one Gimpy Gimpy leaf with gloves and put it in the laboratory. Dry it and forget about it for a few years. And here it lies in front of you, a withered, almost destroyed leaf. It seems harmless, but it's not. Even after many years, the poisonous hairs remain on the leaf surface and still cause toxin effects. Gimpy Gimpy only grows in Australia. It loves the sun and dense green forests. It used to pose a severe danger to tourists and loggers. But now, all places with this plant are marked with a warning sign. 
At botanical exhibitions, scientists put this plant in a cage so people wouldn't touch it. Rosary peas can be white seeds with a black eye or black seeds with a white eye. You can find these plants in Africa, Asia, Australia, and the Pacific Ocean region. So well possible for you to come across one of these underwater animals during a walk on the beach. So take a look at them carefully now and you might just avoid a disaster. Is it fish or is it stone? What you're looking at is commonly known as the stonefish, but its fancier names include the Dornorn and the Sinansia. If you're into diving and observing the underwater, you might already have come across one without noticing. Its appearance makes it almost impossible to distinguish it from a real stone due to its gray coloration and mottled appearance. Especially if you're wearing fogged snorkel goggles. So you better pay attention because otherwise the consequences can be unfortunate since stonefish are the most venomous fish known. Although some types of stonefishes are known to live in rivers and most of them are found in coral reefs near the tropical Pacific and Indian oceans. Their needle-like dorsal fin spines stick up when they're disturbed or threatened and inject the poison they contain. The most common reason why stonefish stings occur is swimmers stepping on them without realizing it. However, you don't need to be in the water to get stung. Since they can survive out of the water for up to 24 hours, you'll have to watch where you step when you're at the beach as well. Those who got stung by stonefish describe their experience to be extremely distressing. Their venom can result in infection, and in some cases, it is known to cause shock and paralysis. It might come as a bit of a shock, but despite its bad reputation, stonefish is edible if it's prepared properly. When the fish is heated, its venom breaks down. And if the dorsal fins, which are the main source of its venom, are removed, raw stonefish is served as part of sashimi too. This creature might look like it came out of a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. Say hello to the blue-ringed octopuses. Don't be deceived by their small size, which can range between 5 to 8 inches, including their arms, because they're packed with venom to cause great damage to as many as 26 people within minutes. Just like stonefishes, blue-ringed octopuses are found in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Japan to Australia. They typically live on coral reefs and rocky areas of the seafloor. Some may also be found in tide pools, seagrass, and algal beds. Blue-ringed octopuses are not aggressive in nature. When they're not seeking food such as crabs or shrimps, or searching for a mate, they often hide in marine debris, shells, or crevices. It's only if they're provoked, cornered, or handled that they get dangerous to humans. When they're threatened, they turn bright yellow or blue iridescent rings appear all over their body as a warning display towards the potential predators. Their bites usually come unnoticed, so you might not be able to realize you're bitten until it's too late. The venom of a blue-ringed octopus can cause dizziness and loss of senses and motor skills, and ultimately, paralysis. So, better try to keep your hands to yourself and back away in a hurry if you see one. Nope, it's not a flower bouquet, so don't try to pick and smell one of those pink tube-like things. What's standing before your eyes is a marine animal called a flower urchin. It may look gorgeous, but don't let the looks deceive you. It was named the most dangerous sea urchin in the 2014 Guinness World Records. Flower urchins inhabit the tropical areas of the Indo-West Pacific and are found among coral reefs, rocks, sand, and seagrass beds at depths of 0 to 295 feet. The most noticeable feature of them is their pedicularia, which are claw-shaped defensive organs that are also found in sea stars. What makes flower urchins differ from any other sea urchin is the fact that their pedicularia is, as the name suggests, flower-like and usually pinkish-white to yellowish-white in color, with a central purple dot. Hidden underneath those flowers, they possess short and blunt spines. Although many sea urchins deliver their venom through such spines, flower urchins deliver their venom through their pedicularia, or flowers. If they're undisturbed, the tips of these flowers are usually expanded into round, cup-like shapes. On their surface, they possess tiny sensors with which they can detect threats. And once they contact such threats, these flowers immediately snap shut and start injecting venom. 
What's weird is that the little claws of the flowers can sometimes break off from their stalks, stick to the point of contact, and continue injecting venom for hours into whoever touched it. Yeesh! Looks like a giant puddle of melted strawberry ice cream, right? You wish! It's a lion's mane jellyfish, which is also called giant jellyfish, arctic red jellyfish, or hairy jelly. They're known to prefer cool water. That's why they can mostly be found in the Arctic, Northern Atlantic, and Northern Pacific Oceans. But it's possible to spot them around the British Isles or in the Scandinavian waters too. Lion's mane jellyfish are one of the largest known species of jellyfish. They get their name from their long, flowing hair-like tentacles and can reach lengths up to 10 feet. And although the average bell diameter of a lion's mane jellyfish is around 20 inches, they can sometimes attain a diameter of over 7 feet. The largest lion's mane jellyfish recorded was seen in 1865 off the coast of Massachusetts. It was measured to have tentacles around 125 feet long and a diameter of 7 feet. To help you picture it, this is longer than a blue whale. Lion's mane jellyfish hunt by extending their tentacles outward and creating a trap to catch their food. Since they have around 1,200 stinging tentacles, the fish would have to be extremely lucky to be able to escape them. The sting of a lion's mane jellyfish is usually not life-threatening, but you would still want to avoid swimming into its tentacles because it can be very painful to humans. And if you see one washed up on the beach, better not touch it because it can still deliver a sting long after they've been on the shore. Fun fact, the lion's mane jellyfish appears in the Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of the Lion's Mane, as a suspect. But don't worry, we won't give you any spoilers. The last marine animal you're seeing now is a sea snake, and yes, they are different from eels. There are 69 identified species of sea snakes. Most of them can be found in the tropical and subtropical waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And they have been around for millions of years. To make things easier, scientists have separated all different species of sea snakes into two categories, true sea snakes and sea crates. Whereas true sea snakes spend almost all their time at sea, sea crates can spend some time on land as well. If you see a snake on the beach, you can tell whether it's a land or sea snake by looking at its tail. If it's paddle-like, then that's a sea snake you got there, but make sure to keep your distance in both cases. All sea snakes need to surface regularly to breathe since they have no gills. That's why you can come across one while swimming. If that happens, you better swim away as fast as you can because most sea snakes have more venom than the average cobra or rattlesnake. However, since they only attack if provoked, bites are quite rare. One more cool fact about sea snakes, they are the only reptiles to give birth in the oceans. The majority of sea snakes keep the eggs within themselves and give birth to nearly fully formed snakes while swimming. That's except for the yellow-lipped sea crate though. They come onto land to lay eggs of their little ones. Remember the stonefish from the beginning of our tour? They're hunted by sea snakes. Blame the food chain. Check this out. There's a giant tornado heading towards you, and it's so fast. These twisters can move at crazy speeds of more than 250 miles per hour. Plus, they can carve a pathway 50 miles long and a mile wide. Sometimes you can see them coming clearly, while in some cases, low-hanging clouds or rain can hide them, so they sneak up on you and you don't even see them. And in most cases, a tornado can develop so fast that no one can even warn you in time if it's already too close. And now, this insane storm is really close. Maybe you have a couple of minutes to get somewhere safe. Do you have a basement? Go hide. Or maybe, I know this is a crazy idea, but what do you think about going inside a tornado to check what it would be like? Now, some tornadoes appear as rope-like swirls, while others have wide clouds in the shape of a funnel. And here's the second one, right before you. Look at these whirling winds born in a thunderstorm. They extend down from it to the ground. Many times, hail joins the party too. The U.S. itself has something like a thousand tornadoes per year. Texas holds the record with about 120 tornadoes per year, a record not to be proud of. But you'll generally see most twisters in Tornado Alley, which is a stretch of land in the Midwestern part of the U.S. 
They develop when warm, moist air coming from Mexico meets cool, dry air from Canada. These two clash and turn into a powerful storm that at some point can spawn tornadoes. And you'll see most tornadoes there between April and June, though lately, some have come even in December. They can range from a regular dust storm to an incredibly powerful force that can carry away cars, large trees, and even houses. But this is a unique chance. You've never been this close, right? Plus, it's a gigantic one. You don't often get to see such a big one. Okay, ready then? It's getting closer. You feel the wind getting stronger while tossing dirt and debris in your face. You close your eyes and whoosh! You're inside, and it's crazy! Vicious winds are hurling and spinning you around. They're lifting you up at the same time. Feeling dizzy? Feeling like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz? Now may be a good time to check what's really happening to you while inside swirling with winds and… Oh wait! Is that your neighbor's motorcycle spinning together with you? Hope it'll stay that far away. Now, let's take a moment to catch up. Being in the middle of a raging tornado is actually something you might survive. But I won't lie to you, it won't be easy. The first thing you'd sense would likely be the temperature changes. Inside this crazy twister, it can be 36 degrees colder than outside of it. That's because the center of the tornado funnel spins all the time. All that funneling makes the inside of the vortex way colder, and it makes the air way thinner than you used to. The air would be 20% less dense than, for example, what you would find at high altitudes. Now, I hope you're not planning to stay there for too long. Disclaimer here, the atmospheric pressure inside this swirling vortex is so low that your lungs won't be able to extract <laughs> enough oxygen. Now, to give you a perspective of all this, breathing inside a tornado is like trying to get some air at an altitude of 26,000 feet. That's a pro level, similar to climbing Everest. So yeah, you'll need some help just to be able to take a regular breath. In short, you'll probably pass out after only a couple of minutes. But don't worry, I brought you this special mask, so breathing is not a problem anymore. Hey, did you notice how smooth the airflow from the inside is? Some storm watchers ended up inside a tornado. Later, they said it all looked so chaotic with all those raging clouds and wind swirling around. But from the inside, the air is surprisingly smooth. But that doesn't mean you'll get a peaceful ride because of it. And it's not a solo party in that thing. The neighbor's motorcycle is not the only thing you'll see there. Wood, bricks, glass, maybe even cars, cows, motorhomes, bricks, roofs, and other big objects. You'd be pretty lucky if nothing crashes into you in all that chaos. With all that debris that's swirling at, for instance, 310 miles per hour, you can hardly avoid it. But let's just say a miracle happens and you got through it. Now you're really dizzy, and you're just wondering when all of this is going to be over and if you're even going to be able to come out of this gigantic tornado. Well, the tornado will eventually slow down. It happens because cool air enters the twister. Just because things are settling down, it doesn't mean you can relax. Well, your stomach here. <laughs> Since all that crazy swirling is done, but the tornado will drop you from whatever height you're on when it stops. If you're somewhere in the countryside, there might be some soft bale of hay to break your fall. Oh wait, we're talking about a twister that's probably more than 45,000 feet tall, so that won't work. I hope you brought your parachute, because now would be a good time to pop it. Nope. Hey, don't worry. I'm all about happy endings, so I'll help you out. Here you go. And now you're slowing down, enjoying the view, if you even see anything around you from all that dizziness. How come there are clear sunlit skies from your left, you may wonder? It's not unusual. Tornadoes often form near the edge of a thunderstorm. It's like a border between two different worlds. And it wasn't even windy. Plus, the air was very still before it hit, right? Well, that's common too. Okay, I think you know this kind of scenario is impossible in reality. So it would be best to find a safe spot quickly if a tornado was close by. Use your underground shelter first. And if you don't have one, your basement could be the next best choice. Prepare ahead of time with a battery-operated TV or radio, together with fresh batteries, or a device with internet to be able to hear the latest updates on the tornado. Include some non-perishable food, water, and other essentials prepared too. 
As it turns out, some people really were picked up by tornadoes, and they managed to go through it. A tornado actually dropped them a few hundred feet away without a scratch. Hey, I'd say that's a whole lot of bother just to save some bucks on Uber. But you can't have a guarantee you'll be safe or where you'll end up. It would be incredibly hard to get out of one of those big and fierce ones, though, like supercells. They fall into the category of the strongest type of storms, mostly thunderstorms. And imagine falling into water spouts. Those could be fine, though, at least the beginning, because they're weak and they form over warm water. So they could be like a part of your spa day, at least until they move inland and turn into a real tornado. Now, dust devils wouldn't be that pleasant. They're not that big, but we're talking about columns of air that rotate at large speeds. And you can easily see them because of all that dirt and dust they pick up, which is why you need glasses for that. Whoops, wait, I forgot that, so I can't help you this time. But if it makes you feel any better, they're not associated with thunderstorms. Hmm, don't know why that would make anyone feel better when I think about it. But if you're willing to jump into a fire tornado, I'll find you a special suit that will keep you safe while spinning through smoke, gas, and flames. I promise! Columns here are narrow, and they rise vertically into the air, similar to a dust devil. Of course, the heat is crazy. And as updrafts are becoming stronger, and if there's enough dry fuel, a fire whirl is turning into a real fire tornado that extends from the ground up to the cloud, moving incredibly fast. Okay, let's stop now. I'm pretty dizzy. Imagine you're hanging out somewhere in the forests of Australia. You're thirsty, so you go to the nearest stream. Suddenly, you feel that you have a runny nose. It's strange because you're perfectly healthy. You stop and wait. A few seconds pass. Your nose is itching. A few minutes pass. Your eyes are watering. Your throat is going crazy. You can't breathe freely. And you're constantly sneezing. It seems you're breathing poisoned air. But what's poisoning it? The smallest particles of the most dangerous plant in the world are flying around you. It's called Gimpy Gimpy. There it is. It looks ordinary. A small bush with green stems and leaves. The closer you come, the worse you're feeling. You need more air, and your skin is turning red. It physically hurts you to be here. You may lose consciousness if you stay here for a little bit more. Do you know what will happen if you touch this plant? Well, it will feel like red-hot needles penetrating your skin. And even if you run away as far as possible from here right now, the pain will not subside. The effects of the sting will last for several hours. Days will pass, and the pain will remain. Weeks and months will pass, but you'll still feel it. You can wash the touch area with cold water and soap, but this won't help a lot. It might not go away for several years. And all those tiny plant hairs that penetrated your skin can stay with you forever. The toxicity of Gimpy Gimpy is so high that even if you tear off one leaf and touch it after a year, it will still cause damage to your body. The bad news is that this plant is hard to spot. You can easily confuse it with burdock or nettle. Just imagine what will happen if someone falls into the bush. Its distinctive feature is a thin layer of fluff on each leaf. But be careful! This fluff consists of thousands of poisonous hairs. They also fly around the plant, so it's dangerous to be here without a gas mask. An ordinary medical mask won't help here, since the hairs can get through the fabric. The good news is, there aren't many of them around the world, and people usually put warning signs near them. This bad guy grows in Australia. Gold miners discovered this plant in 1860, near the town of Gympie. And something is telling me it wasn't the happiest discovery. Even now, Gimpy Gimpy poses a serious danger to loggers and tourists. You may accidentally touch it with your hand. One touch is enough to make you lose your working capacity for several weeks. In some cases, the affected area continues to hurt for decades. One man fell into the bush and lost his mind because of the pain. People compare a Gimpy Gimpy sting with a bite of 30 wasps at the same time. And you won't know how to get rid of it. One guy experienced an unpleasant feeling every time he took a shower for two years after touching this plant. If you want to study it, you need to wear a protective suit and a gas mask. 
there should be no open areas on your body. Tuck your pant legs into your boots, put on protective gloves, and move out into the forest. It grows on the edge, next to streams. Gimpy Gimpy is one of the six species of poisonous trees native to Australia. They love the sun and the vegetation around them. Every hair on the surface of the leaf is poisoned. When it contacts any surface, it opens and sprays a burning toxin. Then, the pain increases and the skin turns red. The duration of the effect depends on the number of hairs that penetrate your body. After a few years, you can put pressure on the bite site and feel the hairs are still there. There's no antidote because scientists still don't know what the toxic poison's components are. All they know is that the poison effect lasts a very long time, several years. It can withstand cold and hot temperatures. Water only enhances its effect. Botanical samples of this plant in laboratories are still dangerous, despite scientists keeping them for several years. After you have passed by Gimpy Gimpy, don't forget to disinfect yourself. Carefully remove clothes, shoes, masks, and glasses. Put a protective suit in the washing machine and wash everything else well. Tiny hairs can be in your pants or the sleeves of your jacket, so be careful. This toxicity makes Gimpy Gimpy the most protected plant in the world. But wait, what's that? Do you see these little holes on its leaves? It seems that someone is eating it. These are the usual nocturnal beetle species. They can devour Gimpy Gimpy all day long, as the poisonous hairs can't harm them. These bugs just don't care. Gimpy Gimpy is the perfect lunch, as no one can disturb these beetles while they're sitting on this plant. And yes, all the animals living nearby know that it's better not to get close to it. But there's one mammal that is not afraid of Gimpy Gimpy. It's a red-legged patamelon. It looks like a little kangaroo and loves to eat the Gimpy Gimpy leaves. Scientists still don't know what exactly protects this animal from toxic hairs. We know almost all the places where this plant grows. People mark them with signs. If you see one, just don't go there. Gimpy Gimpy is a terrible plant, but how about a plant that can take over the whole world and destroy all the crops? It doesn't need favorable conditions for growth. It can survive in the rain, in arid places under the scorching sun, at low and high temperatures. It's called the giant hogweed. If the seed of this plant gets into a vegetable bed or a wheat field, the plant will displace all competitors in a few weeks. The wind can blow on the giant hogweed seeds and spread them further to the nearest territories. This plant can worsen ecosystems around the world. It grows faster than people manage to destroy it. If you spray poison on the leaves, it doesn't even care. If you let parasitic beetles into giant hogweed territory, it doesn't care either. It multiplies very fast and lives longer than many plants. The giant hogweed can reach the height of a one-story huh? house and go deep underground with its roots. It's also dangerous to touch it with your hands. It can turn your skin red, and it won't feel good to say the least. That's how it's making it so hard to fight against it. This poison destroys any plants, bushes, and flowers nearby. Scientists still can't create an effective poison to combat this green monster. No beetles feed on it. That's why the giant hogweed is one of the most dangerous plants in the world. It simply has no enemies in nature. But scientists are sure that evolution will create some creatures capable of destroying the giant hogweed. It can be small bugs or parasitic bacteria. But until that happens, people have to fight this beast on their own. They spend millions of dollars trying to destroy the plant, but it doesn't always work out. You can burn a field, but if one seed remains, it will quickly grow on the scorched ground. You've seen some of the most dangerous plants in the world. But what about trees? A manchineel tree grows in Florida. Its trunk secretes toxic juice that's dangerous for your skin, but it gets much worse during the rain. When water falls on the bark, it mixes with the poison. Then, these poison drops can bounce off the tree and get on your skin. Leaves and fruits also have this toxin, so never hide under this tree in bad weather. Mushrooms, shrubs, and flowers don't grow near this tree either. Animals never come close to it. Birds never sit on its branches. Manchineel trees are resistant to water and high temperatures. Never try to burn it. The smoke released during combustion is toxic and dangerous to your eyes. 
The locals mark this tree with red circles. Who do you think will win? A hungry grizzly or a ripe berry? An angry tiger or a beautiful flower? A huge python or a green bush? The answer's not so obvious. Now you'll see who really controls the jungle and forests. Meet the most dangerous plants on Earth. This is the water hemlock. It grows in North America in swampy areas of fields and meadows. Also, you can find this plant on the shores of rivers and streams. It seems harmless, but it's one of the most poisonous plants in the U.S. Water hemlock toxins can cause critical damage to an adult in 15 minutes, but only if you swallow it. Many people mistakenly confuse it with artichoke, celery, and anise. Despite the dangerous poison, water hemlock is used to cure migraines and intestinal diseases. This plant has caused a lot of damage to livestock. White snake root grows in fields and pastures. When a cow bites it, the plant releases a fat-soluble toxin. This poison gets not only inside the animal, but also into the milk. Young calves who drink the milk also become infected. Poisoned milk is also dangerous for people. The problem is that this plant, native to North America, is one of the longest-lived autumn flowers. Now in modern farms, the poison of this plant is not so dangerous. But on small private pastures, white snake root is the number one danger. We all know two kinds of beans, the ones we eat and the ones that Jack used to get to the realm of giants. In addition to them, there are poisonous ones. These are called castor beans. They contain one of the most dangerous toxins in the world, ricin. As soon as it enters your body, it blocks the production of proteins necessary for life. Without these proteins, your cells stop functioning. The more cells are destroyed, the more your body suffers. The castor bean releases ricin when squeezed. Several beans can cause dehydration, weakness, hallucinations, seizures, and other problems. About seven beans are enough to cause critical damage. So remember what they look like and never touch them if you see them in the woods. One of the most beautiful plants on the planet is also one of the most dangerous. This is oleander. Everything is poisonous in it. The stem, the root, and the pink flower. Even a tiny piece of this plant can lead to severe poisoning. It doesn't need to get inside your stomach to create severe problems. Just a little touch to the juice of the flower causes allergies. And don't try to burn it, as the smoke of a burning oleander has toxic effects too. And now, the most dangerous plant in the world. One touch of it will hurt you for several years. Or you may feel the consequences all your life. The Gimpy Gimpy plant, also called the Queensland Stinger, looks like an ordinary burdock bush. It doesn't look like anything poisonous at all. But if you stand next to this plant, you'll feel suffocation and watery eyes. There are thousands of tiny poisonous hairs on the leaves of this flower. They're so light, they can hang in the air and spread by the wind. So you should put on a gas mask if you want to look at the plant. But if you lightly touch Gimpy Gimpy, you're in big trouble. Some compare one Gimpy Gimpy sting to 30 wasp stings at the same time. Poisonous hairs easily penetrate under your skin and cause irritation and pain. The problem is that you can't pull them out. Wash with soap and water, use some disinfecting ointment, and you'll see that the situation is only worsening. The hairs can't be pulled out of there. They sit there, releasing toxins and driving you crazy. There's no antidote because scientists still don't know what components the toxin consists of. It can withstand cold and hot temperatures. Unpleasant sensations can last for several hours, days, or even months. People who touched the plant said that the pain from the sting returned even after a few years. But if it's impossible to get rid of the hairs, then the only way out is to wait for them to lose their toxicity. But there's another problem here. You can tear off one Gimpy Gimpy leaf with gloves and put it in the laboratory. Dry it and forget about it for a few years. And here it lies in front of you, a withered, almost destroyed leaf. It seems harmless, but it's not. Even after many years, 
the poisonous hairs remain on the leaf surface and still cause toxin effects. Gimpy Gimpy only grows in Australia. It loves the sun and dense green forests. It used to pose a severe danger to tourists and loggers. But now, all places with this plant are marked with a warning sign. At botanical exhibitions, scientists put this plant in a cage so people wouldn't touch it. Rosary peas can be white seeds with a black eye or black seeds with a white eye. You can find these plants in Africa, Asia, Australia, and the Pacific Ocean region. Some species were transported to Florida and Hawaii by people. You could encounter this plant even on city streets. Rosary pea seeds are used in jewelry and some toys. People who wear rosary pea bracelets probably don't know about its seeds toxicity. Rosary peas, as well as the castor bean, contribute to the destruction of cells. Interestingly, rosary pea seeds are used not only as decorations, but also for healing certain health conditions. This is the only poisonous plant from the list that looks poisonous. You probably won't want to pick it up when you notice it. See this red stem that looks more like an artery or an enlarged nervous system? And those berries are similar to eyes. Doll's eye looks a little creepy. Their internal structure is also as unpleasant as their appearance. Doll's eye has a dangerous toxin. The longer they grow, the more poisonous their composition gets. Doll's eye chemicals have a sedative effect on muscles and hearts. This means that your body relaxes so much that it stops working. You've probably seen this plant in reality or wildlife movies. Venus flytraps are rare representatives of carnivorous plants. Fortunately, they're not as dangerous for humans as for insects. But in any case, you shouldn't stick your finger in them. So here's how they work. The plant opens its mouth. There's a red petal with a fragrant smell in its middle. It's a decoy. A fly or some beetle notices this and decides to try it. They climb inside the flower. But the Venus flytrap doesn't immediately get closed. Tiny sensitive hairs inside the plant count the movements of the fly. If the fly has made more than two movements within 20 seconds, the plant closes its mouth in less than a second. This interval prevents the Venus flytrap from needlessly slamming when some garbage lands there. Then the fly becomes trapped. The bristles on the plant's jaws work like a cage. Prey cannot escape. Then the Venus flytrap injects digestive juice into its mouth, which destroys the fly. Five to 12 days later, the plant opens again and waits for a new lunch. The Venus flytrap can eat flies, beetles, spiders, and even little frogs. Giant hogweed causes the most extensive damage among all plants. It's dangerous not specifically for one person, but for entire forests and fields. Giant hogweed is an invasive plant. It's like a parasite. It multiplies quickly and destroys all other flowers in the area. Insects don't feed on giant hogweed. It's also problematic for people to destroy it, since giant hogweed causes an allergic reaction on the skin. It grows quickly, it's immune to poisons, and lives long. Giant hogweed can reach the height of a one-story house and be deeply rooted in the ground. It releases its seeds, and a light breeze spreads them for miles. Scientists still can't create an effective way to combat it. There's nothing that can defeat giant hogweed in nature. Well, not yet. Nature and evolution always find a balance. You check under the sofa. Nope. You open the cupboard. Not there. You lie down on the floor and sneak a peek under your bed. Nah, no kitties there, just dust bunnies. Then where is your cat? Oh no, could that crazy pet slip out through the back door? A wave of panic overwhelms you, and you bolt outside. Your backyard, once green and blooming, is now covered with a thick layer of rock-hard asphalt. Several large fake plants in pots make the dull landscape somewhat more upbeat. Anyway, where's that pussycat of yours? Oh no, just as you feared, your kitty spotted something on the ground and is now playing with it. You get closer. Incredible! A tiny green sprout has broken through the asphalt. 
but it means your cat is in grave danger. Because these days, plants are more treacherous than bears, crocodiles, or even sharks. Until a couple of years ago, most people knew next to nothing about carnivorous plants. If you had asked an expert, though, they would have excitedly submerged you in a sea of information. Meat-eating plants used to munch on tiny creatures, mostly insects, frogs, more rarely a mouse or rat. That is, until recently. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Back when days were good, there were just about 700 kinds of carnivorous plants on the planet. They grew all over the world, except Antarctica. Nobody likes Antarctica except penguins. Even before the disaster, people kept discovering new species of meat-eating plants. Some of them were in the process of becoming carnivorous. Those had their leaves coated with wax. A bug landed on it and slipped right into the plant's water-filled pitcher. Some carnivorous plants wooed insects not only to snack on them. Some flying critters were needed to spread the plant's pollen. That's one of the reasons meat-eating plants had, and still have, bright, colorful flowers. These blooms were high above the treacherous leaves, as far away from the traps as possible. This way, pollinators didn't get eaten before they helped the plant to reproduce. Good old plants got most of their food by basking in the sun. But it wasn't enough. They also needed nutrients, which they slurped up with their roots. But carnivorous plants lived in areas with nutrient-poor soil. That's why they started to catch prey. Such a high-protein diet helped them survive and grow faster. Some meat-eating plants didn't even have special digestive enzymes. They used to partner up with good bacteria. And while those bacteria took care of prey, the plant itself concentrated on making its physical trap stronger. Little did we know at that time that soon, life would change beyond recognition. That we would need all the available information about the planet's flora. Because when a scientific experiment went way out of control, all plants on Earth, and I do mean all, became carnivorous. The event even got the name of the Great Carnivorous Disaster. Slowly but surely, grass, trees, and bushes started to transform. Not all of them grew bigger, but some did. Plus, each plant species picked its own way to catch its prey. You cautiously come closer to the spot where your cat keeps playing with an innocent-looking tree sprout. Even though you know the plant is still weak and isn't likely to harm your pet, the sight makes you shudder. You have to figure out which kind of plant it is. Green meat-eaters use a bunch of different methods to catch their prey. Those are pit-shaped and snap traps, sticky goo, flypaper traps, and many others. Still, all of them involve modified leaves. The plant you're currently looking at uses sticky tentacles to get its food. If these tentacles were motionless, sunlight would glint off them, attracting insects. But this plant is a proud owner of moving tentacles. And right now, you watch them wrap around your kitty's tail. You put on a glove you now always keep in your back pocket. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Then you gently and carefully pry the surprisingly strong tentacle open. The plant doesn't seem to be poisonous, but still. You can't but feel relieved it's not a snap trap one. Those take after the iconic meat-eater Venus flytrap. Their leaves are divided in half. On the ends, they have spikes that create a seal. Once an insect, or these days, an animal makes its way in between the serrated leaves, they snap shut. The whole process takes less than a second. This is the most treacherous kind of carnivorous plants. Snaptrap plants have leaves covered with short, stiff hairs. They're called sensitive or trigger hairs. If something or someone touches them, the trap springs into action. The plant produces digestive juices, similar to those in your stomach. In 5 to 12 days, there's almost nothing left from the prey. The trap reopens, and the scarce remains get washed away by rain. These days, people can't feel safe even underwater. Now, all seaweed, every single blade of grass, can't wait to munch on your finger. Life has dramatically changed in many ways. The construction of new roads and highways that were supposed to go through forests need much more preparation, safety measures, and more advanced tools. On the plus side, 
The planet has more oxygen than ever before. People have started to adjust their lifestyles to the new reality. We no more jog in the park, cycle, swim in open water, and enjoy other outdoor activities. Gyms, swimming pools, and takeout restaurants have become super popular. The great carnivorous disaster has changed people's diets. Growing good old veggies isn't an easy feat these days. Potatoes, carrots, broccoli, you name it, have become a rare delicacy. People don't walk anymore. You never know which tree or bush on your way might attack you because you look delicious enough to lunch on. That's why there's an ever-increasing demand for cars. All flower shops have gone out of business. The lovely floral arrangements had a nasty habit of eating the customers. Weddings certainly changed. The simple custom of throwing the bride's bouquet to the bridesmaids changed to imply an attempt on someone's life. Unfortunately, many animals have gone extinct, mostly the slower ones. Those animals that have survived the disaster are either evolving to live alongside carnivorous plants or skedaddling to safer areas. Lots of animals that used to live in the wild are now moving closer to towns and cities. By the way, the safest and most popular places to settle down nowadays are deserts. Despite a lack of water in supermarkets, more and more people build houses and relocate there. And people who opt for living in a desert don't mind walking around a cactus or two on their way to the car. Even though some of these cacti have learned to detect prey and shoot at it with their needles. It's still unclear how they get to the falling prey afterward. They can't crawl, can they? There are still original meat-eating plants here, but they've evolved to be much stronger and larger. In any case, people are still learning to live in this new world of meat-eating plants. Boy, what I wouldn't give for a really good herbicide right now. Superpowers? Believe it or not, some animals have them. From sticky tongues to changing colors, you're about to meet 13 amazing animals with some very special abilities. If you have ants in your pants or termites in the house, you'll wish you lived next door to this animal. The giant anteater lives up to its name. It's 6.5 feet long, from snout to tail. If it stood up on its hind legs, it would be taller than most people. Good thing it only eats insects. With a diet of ants and termites, it gobbles close to 35,000 of the little critters in a single day. To capture its meal, the anteater is equipped with a long, narrow tongue. About two feet long, it's made of small, backward-pointing spines and covered in sticky saliva. When it comes across an anthill, the anteater uses its massive claws to dig into the earth. As the ants go scrambling, it flicks out its tongue, up to 150 times per minute, and the ants stick to it. Slurp? Now, the giant anteater doesn't have teeth for biting and chewing. It's part of a group of animals known as edentate, which means lacking teeth. Instead, the giant anteater grinds its food against the roof of its mouth. A tongue like that would certainly make eating popcorn at the movies more interesting. Another animal with an amazing tongue is the alligator snapping turtle. No, its tongue is not long and sticky. Instead, it has a small, blood-filled addition that looks like a little pink worm. When the turtle gets hungry, it will lay perfectly still under the water. The only thing moving, that worm-like appendage. Any fish that swims in for a closer look quickly becomes dinner. This turtle is also very good at holding its breath. It can stay underwater for 50 minutes while waiting for a bite to eat. Most humans can only hold their breath for one to two minutes. Another amazing tongue? The penguin has a cool one. It doesn't have any taste buds and is covered in keratinized bristles instead. Yep, keratin is the same stuff that makes up our fingernails and hair. These spiky protrusions point backward into the throat, and the fish can only move in one direction, into the penguin's tummy. But one of the coolest tongues in the animal world belongs to the chameleon. Unlike the anteater, the chameleon can only eat one insect at a time. Its tongue ends in a sticky ball of muscle. It shoots the tongue out, and when it hits its prey, that muscle changes shape. It becomes a suction cup, helping grab the insect and pull it back into the chameleon's mouth. If you've ever tried to grab a fly, you know how hard it is. Those things are fast. The chameleon's tongue, then, needs to be even faster. And it is. 
It can theoretically travel 8,000 feet per second. There's no way an insect will see it coming and have time to escape. The chameleon has another special trick. It can change colors. It was once believed that the animal did it as a way to hide from enemies. It would change its color to blend into the background, nearly becoming invisible. But this isn't really the reason behind this special ability. As cold-blooded animals, chameleons can't regulate their body temperature like we do. They become darker in color as a way to absorb heat from the sun. And they turn lighter to reflect that heat to cool down. They also use this ability to communicate with other chameleons. One color might tell a rival to stay away. Another can be used to attract a partner. It's like their version of emojis. When it comes to color changing, though, the chameleon is no match for the cuttlefish. Related to the squid and octopus, these cute ocean creatures can change the color and texture of their skin. This means they can look like almost anything in their environment, from a random rock on the ocean floor to a piece of floating vegetation. They truly are the world's champions at hide-and-seek. This ability comes in super handy when trying to hide from dolphins, sharks, or seals that see cuttlefish as a delicious snack. An animal that relies on camouflage 24-7 is the walking stick, or stick insect. As its name suggests, it looks like a twig with legs. It can range in size from one inch to one foot long. And while it's hiding in the tree, looking like just another tiny branch, it can eat all it wants. As an herbivore, it's very happy munching on leaves. Just don't grab one by accident next time you play fetch with Fido. But there are some animals that do the exact opposite. Through time, they have evolved to actually stand out as a way to warn predators of potential danger. This often involves bright coloring and patterning and is called oposemitism. An example of this is the monarch butterfly. When you see one, it's easy to marvel at its beautiful orange coloring and the pattern on its wings. But with such a bright appearance, surely it makes it easy for predators to find. Actually, the bright color is a warning that eating a monarch can be a bad idea. Because of their diet in the larval stage, monarchs are very poisonous. Any animal that eats one will become quite ill and will never risk doing it again. The white and black stripes of a skunk are there for the same reason. It lets other animals know that if you mess with the skunk, you're in for a nasty surprise. Skunks have two glands in their rear that can emit a noxious spray called theol. It smells like rotten eggs. The animal can actually aim its spray, making its defense a powerful one. And they can spray six times in a row. After that, they'll be defenseless for 10 to 14 days while their glands develop more of that wonderful perfume, eau de skunk. And once you've been sprayed, it's very difficult to get it off, even with a shower. So when you see a skunk in the wild, make sure to give it plenty of room to do its own thing. Like the skunk, the porcupine gives you 30,000 very good reasons to leave it alone. It's covered in many sharp quills. And because of the nearly 800 barbs near the tip of each one, these quills are difficult to remove if you get one stuck in your skin. Luckily, one common belief about porcupines is wrong. They cannot shoot those quills through the air. You have to touch one before it can come off. There are animals even underwater that have special powers for defense. The electric eel has a very shocking ability, though you've probably already guessed what it is. It has organs in its body that can release a powerful electric charge of up to 800 volts, which is higher than the voltage in an electrical outlet. The creature uses this to stun smaller animals or zap its enemies. It can also create electric pulses to communicate, sending out a form of Morse code to other eels. Instead of an electric charge, archer fish use spit to capture their next dinner. When you first see one, you wouldn't think it was at all special. It looks like any other fish. Yawn. But wait, because it really does have a superpower. Archer fish feed on insects. Insects, however, don't live in the water. This makes it difficult for the archer fish to eat. So what does this little critter do? Relying on the special design of its mouth and its great eyesight, it spits out a powerful stream of water. This knocks an unsuspecting insect over. It falls into the water and the archer fish pounces. The stream is so precise that it can hit an insect up to five feet away. A creature with a similar but much more disgusting ability is the horned lizard. 
it can flood the sinus area near the eye with blood. Then, when it feels threatened, it will squirt that blood out of its eye socket. This can travel as far as four feet. This is enough to startle an enemy, giving the lizard time to escape. It will also use this special skill to remove dirt and dust that gets into its eye. And finally, the one animal you'll probably never meet in your lifetime, even though they live all over the planet, is the tardigrade. Also known as water bears or moss piglets, these are microscopic eight-legged animals that have even gone to outer space and survived. They're pretty much indestructible and have been found in the deep sea and the frozen wasteland of Antarctica. In order to survive in the harshest conditions, they will transform into dehydrated balls called tons. And in this form, they have been known to survive at temperatures as low as minus 328 degrees Fahrenheit and as high as 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Those are all some pretty amazing powers. Well, except for the blood shooting from the eye. That's just gross. North Yungas Road in Bolivia is one of the most picturesque and most hazardous roads in the world. Just imagine biking along a cliff trail at a mind-numbing height, overlooking the lush Bolivian jungle and misty mountains at a distance. What a view! But as soon as you realize you're riding on a 10-foot wide stretch of road, some of which isn't even paved, you might get skin crawls. And for a good reason. Over 200 folks tumble to their demise each year on this devious mountain climb. And the absence of any guardrail doesn't help at all. Now, if you're more into walking, consider the Husseini Bridge in Pakistan. It's officially the most dangerous hanging bridge in the world, but hardly the only one in the country. It's a long and nerve-wracking traverse over Lake Borat, with many planks of the bridge missing and the whole construction creaking ominously in the wind. Still, the place has become a major tourist attraction, although the old and broken bridge visible nearby only adds to the impression that you're inevitably going to fall to a screaming end. Well, at least you can be thankful that the lake beneath is not Lake Natron in Tanzania. If you fall into water, you still have a chance of survival. If you fall into the waters of Natron, not so much. The pH levels here are a skin-melting 10.5. What passes for water is more like an alkaline soup. No wonder this place is so peaceful. Pretty much nothing wants to live here. And yet, flocks of flamingos come to Lake Natron to breed every few seasons, and it becomes a white-pink paradise for the period. Positively. Which can't be said about the Danakil Depression in Ethiopia. Despite its beautiful, otherworldly landscape, it's perhaps the loneliest place on Earth. Yellow, orange, and green mounds are made of salt, sulfur, and iron, creating views like nowhere else on the planet. Yet the combination of temperature and toxic minerals makes this place absolutely unlivable. Researchers coming here haven't found even microscopic life in this valley. Really, like another planet. Beautiful and desolate. On the other hand, there's an island that's bubbling with life, yet still you don't want to be there. It's called Snake Island, and the name says it all. It's chock full of snakes. In fact, there are so many of them, especially the venomous varieties, that Brazil has forbidden access to the island to any and all visitors. But even if it wasn't closed off, not many would be brave enough to go to a place where a single step offshore could land you a venomous bite. Now, I'll bet that fly geyser in the middle of the Nevada desert was created partly because humans became jealous of that. This place had been just another bit of desert until 1916. People came here to drill a water well. They quickly saw the error of their ways, though. The water came out boiling hot and unfit for drinking. Fifty years later, there was another attempt, but the same thing happened. We don't learn, do we? Anyway, hot water never stops spewing from under the ground. And today, we have a massive geyser cluster colored in shades of red, orange, and yellow. Now, I'd say let's take a break from things that could bite, burn, or crush you and take a walk in a serene forest. We're in Japan, and it's Sagano Bamboo Forest, a marvelous natural park 
where you can't help but hush your voice and just look. And listen, too. Because the sound of the wind in the bamboo trees is the first ever officially recognized soundscape. All the more surprising to find such a place just half an hour's ride from Kyoto, one of the busiest cities in the country. Take a deep breath of fresh air now. You're gonna need it. We're going underwater. Behold the Great Blue Hole, apparently named by Captain Obvious. It's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Located off the coast of Belize, this giant sinkhole is a massive tourist attraction, especially popular among divers. It's actually a whole cave system, and they say it gets weirder and more picturesque the deeper you dive. Beware, though! It's popular among sharks, too, and both bull sharks and hammerheads have been spotted here more than once. Here, have a towel and prepare for some barbecue. The Darvasa gas crater is waiting. A huge hole again, this time in the ground and burning. Over 50 years ago, geologists found this spot in Turkmenia, Central Asia, and were quite a bit alarmed. There was an enormous deposit of methane, a highly flammable gas, underground. They set it on fire to prevent the gas from spreading, and since then, the holes kept burning. It's over 200 feet across and 100 feet deep, and no one knows when it'll finally run out of fuel. Is it too hot again? Well, let's have a little swim with jellyfish then. Jellyfish Lake on one of the rock islands in Palau is perfectly described by its name. In 2005, there were about 30 million of these creatures here. Although today only 700,000 of them remain, their number is growing, and tourists can actually swim with them. Until they get stung, that is. Okay, kidding. These jellyfish don't have stingers, so it's safe. Until they decide to grow stingers, of course. From the depths, we're going even deeper. The Gomantong Caves are our next stop. The cave system on the island of Borneo could have been Batman's hideout, given how many bats live there. At night, these nocturnal animals fly out of the cave in the thousands, making you wonder why you're still there watching it. But if you're brave enough to go inside the cave, you can truly marvel at the variety given to us by nature. Because there, on the floor and walls of the cave, lie tons of bat droppings, giving food and home to millions of cockroaches, parasites, and giant centipedes. Wondrous. Okay, I'm out of here. Now, if you're as easy to get away as I am, here's a place to go. Medidi National Park in Bolivia. It's one of the largest protected areas in South America and is home to an immense variety of animals, birds, and insects. I could do without the mosquitoes, but it's still among the few places where you could see wild macaws, monkeys, capybaras, and dozens of other creatures. Still, it's better to be careful because wild animals aren't always happy to see you. And there are known cases of attacks on tourists. Ever wanted to feel like Frodo Baggins in Middle Earth? Here's your chance! In Iceland, there's a slumbering volcano named Thrigúka Gegurth that welcomes guests to a tea party. Now, don't confuse this with another infamous Icelandic volcano, Eyjafjallajökull. Yukuk. Yeah, it's easy to mix them up, they sound so similar. Here, tourists are actually ushered down into the volcano and spend close to an hour inside, looking at the magmatic landscape. They say Thrinuka Gegur can't wake up all of a sudden, but who knows? Don't forget to bring the Ring of Power just in case. From the lowest dungeon to the highest peak, and here we are at Mount Hua in China. It's called the most dangerous hike in the world for a reason. It's high, it's crazy scary, and it's a hike. At the height of 7,000 feet, which already makes me reconsider, there are several wooden planks nailed to the sheer wall of the mountain. When you get to the start of the hike, you put on safety gear and realize there's no turning back. You have to walk all the way. And then back. But if you're lucky, you'll see a crowd of hundreds of tourists and decide not to spend hours waiting for your turn. Finally. To really creep you out, I'm taking you to Pripyat in Ukraine. If you watch the TV show Chernobyl, you probably know what happened in this area. If you didn't see it, well, don't have a meltdown. Much of the town is still off-limits for visitors, but there are already guided tours around the place. As haunting as it is, the landscape has some magnetic force. The silence makes you keep as quiet as you can. 
Also, you can see with your own eyes what happens when people abandon a whole city. Nature takes back what once belonged to it. Creeping vines along the walls and lampposts, trees and bushes sprouting from under concrete. And the main attraction in this desolate place is the rusty old Ferris wheel. That sure shivers my timbers. You're hiking in the wilderness, looking for a safe spot to set up camp. All you can hear are leaves and branches crackling under your footsteps. Some squirrels are running up a tree over there. But suddenly, something unexpected happens. You notice something weird in the distance in between the trees. It kind of looks like a concrete structure of some kind. Weird. At this point, you're at least 20 miles deep into the woods, and there are no nearby towns or villages, as far as you know. So you decide to go off the trail with your friends to get a closer look. But as you get nearer, you realize that it's leading to nowhere. Hmm, what's it doing here in the middle of literally nowhere? And it doesn't even lead to anything. You put on your Sherlock Holmes cap and investigate. So, maybe there used to be an old house or mansion here that collapsed over the years, and the only thing left is a staircase? But weirdly enough, After circling the bizarre structure, you realize there's no trace of any ruins or even foundations. It's like someone just sliced a staircase off their house, cake style, and plopped it here for no reason. Okay? You and your friends aren't really into getting a whole lot closer. Something feels wrong. The longer you look at this weird structure, the more you feel a super creepy presence. Something tells you you should probably leave the area as fast as possible. As weird as this sounds, discoveries of random staircases illogically found in the woods are surprisingly common. Some are made of wood, others of brick or stone. Some look ancient, while others look like they were finished yesterday. The one thing they all have in common, they all lead to absolutely nowhere, and they're all found in super mysterious locations. One of the most famous ones is in Chesterfield, New Hampshire. A long, medieval-looking staircase made of stones with Roman arches in the middle of the woods. It's believed to have been part of Madame Antoinette Sherry's castle. She was a big singer back in Paris. The castle dates back about 100 years, and it was later discovered again in 1962. This time, there was nothing but a staircase. Another mysterious ancient staircase dates back to 9,000 years ago. It's in a forest in Italy. It looks like a series of stairs that lead to a tiny platform at the top. Now, why go through all the trouble of building the thing if it leads to nowhere? Well, some scientists think it could have been some sort of ritual tower. But your guess is as good as theirs. There's an anomaly in the Indian Ocean known as the Indian Ocean Geoid Low, or IOGL. It produces the largest distorting natural gravitational force in the world. Heavy mineral deposits, many deep-sea trenches, and magma reservoirs disturb the magnetic field in this area. Earth's gravity changes in different places around the planet. It allows researchers to look for patterns and figure out what's happening beneath the surface. Higher gravity fields usually mean denser materials below and vice versa. Some scientists believe that the anomaly might be a dent in the planet's mantle that is working its way up to the crust. The Nihau Island actually rejects the fruits of today's advancements. There are no cars in sight since the locals get around on foot or by bicycles. No wonder their legs have great definition. They thrive without running water, internet, or shops. The only school on the entire island is powered by solar energy with a backup generator. And what's awesome is that it's the only school in the state that's powered by the sun. Being a resident of the island, the local explains some ground rules the permanent residents must abide by. If they do break these rules, they can be evicted. Now, not far from Bangkok, in northeastern Thailand, there's a 75-million-year-old rock formation. These rocks look like three whales swimming together. The beautiful design created by nature became known as Three Whales Rock. Millions of years ago, this area was just a desert. But the land was changing. 
Gradually, sandstone got pulled apart by the movements of tectonic plates and erosion. That's how these spectacular formations were created. If you decide to explore the system of trails around Three Whales Rock, you'll find waterfalls and an abundance of fauna and flora there. Located on Gamal and Gaiden peninsulas, these expansive pit holes were discovered in 2014. They seem to be still changing and evolving. The pits grow wider, and people find them more often. Of course, there's no shortage of theories about how they appeared. Suggestions range from meteorite impacts to the activity of other civilizations. But the most common explanation is that methane gas reacted to water molecules after the planet's permafrost started to melt. This resulted in bubbles of methane bursting through the ice. The craters could be thousands of years old, but nobody knows for sure. You're driving to the state of New Mexico, to the small town of Taos. 2% of the locals hear a strange buzzing in the air every day. Some residents believe the sound is somehow connected with technologies used by guests from other galaxies. Also, there is a theory that something sinister lives in the town. They say Taos is cursed. An evil spirit or a phantom punishes people for something their ancestors did in the past. Scientists still can't explain the nature of this sound. Another theory says it's caused by unusual acoustics of the location, while others think the buzzing is a hallucination. Some can hear it because everybody talks about something, and our minds create an illusion of the sound that doesn't really exist. The sound isn't the same for everyone, either. For some, it's a low hum. For others, it's more of a buzzing sound. But this is not the only place where you can hear the strange noises. It's called the hum, and people worldwide claim to have heard it. Some dwellers of a small village in Scotland describe it as a low, thick hum. Well, some residents of Florida heard a similar sound, too. It's not exactly known where this phenomenon appeared, but the first time the media started talking about it was in the 1970s in England. Also, there are written records of a mysterious buzzing dating back almost 200 years. According to some estimates, only about 2% of people on the planet can hear the hum. Perhaps their ears pick up some low-frequency waves, or the reason is something else entirely. Maybe, just maybe, they hear humming because the person doing it doesn't know the words to the song. Yeah, that joke is also 200 years old. A volcano in Indonesia spews bright blue lava and produces electric blue and purple flames. This phenomenon occurs because the volcano has some of the highest levels of sulfur in the world. You can also know you're near it by its foul stench. But I digress. And when sulfuric gases interact with scorching hot air and get lit by the molten lava, they turn blue. You can also find the world's largest acid lake inside this crater. Yep, it's a real stinker. Underwater rivers and lakes are called brine pools for a reason. High salinity makes the water in them denser than the seawater around. That's why it sinks to the bottom, forming rivers and lakes. Those have waves of their own, and these waves can sometimes lap up against the shorelines. If you went down there in the submarine, it would easily float on the surface of a brine pool. But without a submarine, swimming in such a lake would be too risky. They contain too much toxic methane and hydrogen sulfide. Yeah, I'd pass on that too. But hey, be my guest! Cave of Crystals in Mexico is home to the world's most unique crystal formations. Thanks to super-rare conditions in the cave, crystals there grow to unbelievable sizes. The air inside is incredibly humid. The water contains tons of minerals that boost the growth of the Milky White giants. Some of them are longer than telephone poles. Cylindrical snow donuts occur when a wind gust starts to roll some snow across a snowy area, as if making a snowball. If it was a real thing, it would eventually become too heavy for the wind to move. But a snow donut's center is hollowed out. This happens because its inner layer is too thin and is blown away when the donut is formed. This makes the thing lighter than a snowball. That's also why it rolls further. Unfortunately, snow donuts are rare because they need very precise conditions to appear. 
The Danakil Depression in Ethiopia is probably one of the most bizarre-looking places you'll ever see. It's dotted with neon-colored hot springs, lava pools, and vast salt flats. You've got to be especially careful there. Toxic gases are swirling over hydrothermal fields, and many pools are super acidic. So, mm, don't go swimming. Until at least 30 minutes after lunch. (laughs) Just kidding. And finally, there's nothing mysterious about 28,000 rubber ducks found in the sea in 1992. That's when a ship transporting bath toys got lost in the ocean while traveling from Hong Kong to the U.S. Some of these ducks are still floating in the ocean several decades later. They've been spotted in South America, Alaska, Hawaii, and even Australia. And they make bath time lots of fun. Ooh, rubber ducky! In Russia, on the shores of the Baltic Sea, there's an enigmatic national park. The Dancing Forest is a place that no scientist has managed to explain so far. The pine trees of the forest are all crooked and twisted into loops and spirals. The forest didn't appear until the early 60s, when the pines were planted in order to make the sand dune in that area more stable. One theory is that it's the unstable sand that made the trees twist in such a way. Other theories for the crooked trees are strong winds, or even supernatural powers. Some people say the forest is a place where positive and negative energies meet, twisting the trees. Local legend says that if a person climbs through one of the rings of a tree, it'll add an extra year to this person's life, or they'll be granted a wish. I like that one. Speaking of bizarre trees, and I was, one grows in the region of Piedmont, Italy. There, a cherry tree grows on the top of a mulberry tree. The strange thing is that both trees are perfectly healthy. A continuous storm at Saturn's North Pole has an odd shape, a hexagon. This is probably because of the gradient of the winds. The total length of this cloud pattern is 9,000 miles, which is about 1,200 miles longer than the Earth's diameter. The hexagon has been observed for many years, but it gets even more mysterious because it changes color too. It used to be turquoise, but it has recently shifted to a golden color. The reason for the color change is that the pole gets exposed to sunlight as the seasons change. Now, rain isn't unusual for Oakville, Washington. However, this one still doesn't have any solid scientific explanation. Instead of common raindrops, people watch translucent jelly-like blobs fall from the skies. These blobs covered about 20 square miles. Those who got really close to the rain experience flu-like symptoms. What were the blobs? Researchers claim that the blobs contain human white blood cells. Later tests showed no presence of nuclei. Some people claim the blobs might have been evaporated jellyfish resulting in rain, or maybe even waste from a commercial plane. Walking rocks, also known as sailing rocks, move across the Death Valley National Park in California without any external intervention, leaving long trails in the dirt and sand along their way. Various time-lapse footages of the moving rocks have been taken. Scientists even installed GPS navigators on some of the rocks, and it showed that the rocks move at a considerable speed. Some researchers believe that the movement is due to thin sheets of ice that form overnight at freezing temperatures in the valley, letting the rocks move until it melts during the day. Or there was a Rolling Stones concert. Nah. The Batageka crater in Siberia looks like a doorway to the underworld. It's about a half mile long and over 280 feet deep, but it never stops growing. As it gets deeper, it exposes more underground layers. The layers show what our planet looked like thousands of years ago, as the slumps reveal the used-to-be climates. The crater appeared back in the 60s, and it all started with rapid deforestation. Trees no longer cast shade on the ground, and it got hotter. The permafrost melted, resulting in the crater formation. The throbbing hum in Taos, New Mexico has driven locals wild since the 1990s. The low-frequency hum deprives people of sleep and depletes their energy. Even though scientists have tried to find the source of the hum, 
they still haven't pinpointed its origin. Different variations of the hum have also been heard in the UK, Australia, Canada, and other areas of the US. Luckily, only about 2% of the world's population can hear it. The hums have been blamed on mechanical devices, multiple disturbances of auditory systems, and even animals. The West Seattle hum, for example, was blamed on toadfish. Fairy rings, also known as elf rings or pixie rings, are mysterious rings of mushrooms that appear in grasslands and forested areas. There's a lot of debate about why these fungi form a nearly perfect circle. Some superstitions claim that fairy dances would burn the ground, causing mushrooms to rapidly grow. In Costa Rica, there's an assortment of about 300 spherical stone balls. Locals call them las bolas, which is simply the balls in English. These stones have an almost perfect round shape. Some of them are huge, weighing up to 16 tons each. They're also made of different materials – gabbro, limestone, and sandstone. They're considered to have been put in straight lines in front of the chief's houses, but there's no precise information of their origin. Some myths claim that these stones originated in Atlantis. Mm. If you ever travel to the Mekong River in late October, you have a chance of seeing glowing balls rising from the water and beelining up into the air. Locals call these glowing balls the Naga Fireballs. The size of the lights vary. The reddish balls can be as tiny as a spark and as large as a basketball. There can be dozens to thousands of balls a night. Scientists don't have any solid explanation for why it happens, but it could be due to flammable gases released by the marshy environment. Some superstitious locals are sure it's all because of a giant serpent living in the Mekong. Great balls of fire! In Minnesota, on the north shore of Lake Superior, there's a park known for the Devil's Kettle. This is a waterfall that splits in two. One part of the river continues, while the other part disappears into a hole in the ground. Whatever object you throw into the Devil's Kettle won't reappear. Scientists still haven't fully explained where the water that drops into the hole goes. Devil's Kettle is considered to be unsafe for people because it's nearly impossible to trace the flow. Yeah, not a place to go tubing. Grunions are fish known for their bizarre mating ritual. The females climb out of the water and onto the shore. They dig their tails into the sand in order to lay eggs. The legs stay hidden in the sand, waiting. Ten days later, the high tide comes, washing the newly hatched young to the sea. Scientists still can't give any solid explanation for this way of breeding. People who live in rural central Norway over the Hestalen Valley can often witness floating lights of white, yellow, and red cross the sky. The lights appear both at day and night, and once back in the 80s, they were spotted 15 to 20 times in a single week. The Hestalen lights can last just a few seconds, but sometimes they can last more than an hour. The lights move, seeming to float or even sway around. Some scientists believe that the reason for these lights is due to ionized iron dust. Others say it's combustion that includes sodium, oxygen, and hydrogen. Many people claim they're just misidentified aircrafts. Yellowstone Park has a famous boiling lake, but it's not the world's only place of boiling water. Deep in the Amazon, there's the 4-mile Chanay Tempishka River that's always hot. The name means boiled by the sun. Well, it's not exactly boiling, but it can reach 196 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to cook pasta. Ooh, let's try that. The lowest temperature in these waters is about 113 degrees. This river still can't be scientifically explained because it would require close proximity to a volcano for the water to reach such temperatures. However, the closest volcano is 400 miles away. But there could be a fault between the Earth that could explain this phenomenon. In western Venezuela, locals living close to the Catatumbo River aren't afraid of lightning because they see it almost every single night. It starts at around 7 o'clock and doesn't stop until dawn. The everlasting Catatumbo lightning did once stop for a few months, from January to March 2010. It was probably due to drought, or maybe the charge ran out. 
In 1991, a scientist suggested that the phenomenon happens because of cold and warm air currents meeting in the area. Another theory is that the lightning could be due to the presence of uranium in the bedrock. Speaking of lightning, I got a bolt. Bye! You feel some rumbling from below. No, it's not your tummy. It's low and ominous. You look up and see strange lights hanging above the ground. They look like shimmering balls of light hovering high up in the sky. Your throat goes dry, and you gulp. That's what they call the earthquake lights. This phenomenon is poorly understood, but witnesses say they've seen it in different shapes and sizes. It could be in the form of light balls, sheet lightning, streamers, and a steady glow in the sky. Soon after, a strong earthquake follows. Scientists can't explain why those lights appear, and they don't always do either. Some believe that's a reaction of underground gases released into the atmosphere. Sure enough, an earthquake begins. But lucky you, it's not as strong as you expected. The ground is shaking, but you even manage to keep your balance. It stops as abruptly as it began, and you walk home. On the way home, you see a flash and hear a whip crack. Lightning has struck a lone tree near where you just stood. It's caught on fire, and... There's a column of flames rising to the sky. Still no rain, and the pillar becomes taller and taller. Have you heard of such a thing as a fire tornado? These phenomena occur when the wind is caught in a circle close to the ground because of the difference in air pressure. Such mini tornadoes are usually easy to notice. Small rubble, dust, sand, and leaves rise into the air and start flying in rapid circles. But then, if there's a source of fire nearby, the funnel can catch it and blow it stronger, like bellows. The flames go round and round, reaching ever higher and eventually creating a swirling, blazing tower. Luckily, fire tornadoes are short-lived and don't normally cause much damage. But don't try to hide from the storm under that tree. You can find this unusual plant in Florida and in some parts of the Caribbean coast. Externally, it doesn't look special at all. A great trunk, green leaves, and fruit similar to small apples. What you must remember is never to pluck these apples and never stand next to the tree, especially if it's raining. This is the manchineel tree, which is considered the most dangerous in the world. Its trunk, bark, branches, and fruit contain poisonous juice. One drop of this corrosive acidic liquid can harm your skin a lot. The tree can secrete this juice and if you accidentally touch it, you risk burning your hand. When it rains, water droplets fall on the tree and mix with the poison. Water can also bounce off the bark and get on your skin. That's why you shouldn't stand nearby either. There are almost no other shrubs or mushrooms growing around. Animals avoid these trees, and people don't chop them and don't pluck the fruit. You can't make a bonfire from their branches. Burning wood emits poisonous smoke that can damage your eyes. Locals know this tree well, but tourists and travelers might accidentally get harmed. That's why most manchineel trees are marked with paint or have a warning sign. In western Venezuela, locals living close to the Catatumbo River aren't afraid of lightning because they see it almost every single night. It starts at around 7 o'clock and doesn't stop until dawn. The everlasting Catatumbo lightning did one stop for a few months, from January to March 2010. It was probably due to drought, or maybe the charge ran out. In 1991, a scientist suggested that the phenomenon happens because of cold and warm air currents meeting in the area. Another theory is that the lightning could be due to the presence of uranium in the bedrock. Not all lightning happens inside clouds. There's a rare phenomenon called a dirty thunderstorm. The lightning happens above a volcano. The most famous is in Japan. It erupts almost every day and spits black clouds high into the air. So it's super scary volcano clouds plus lightning. Whoa! Regular lightning happens during a storm when ice crystals bump into each other. In a dirty thunderstorm, bits of volcanic ash collide, create friction, and spark up the sky. In the hottest and one of the driest places on Earth, Africa's Donakil Desert, temperatures often rise above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The out-of-this-world landscape has many active volcanoes and geysers that spit out toxic gases like chlorine and sulfur. 
the vibrantly green, electric blue, and yellow waters are all rain and seawater warmed up by magma. One wrong step here, and you'd be gone for good. This happened in June 2009. People in certain areas in Japan left their homes after a heavy downpour, only to find fish, frogs, and tadpoles everywhere. Fields, roads, lawns, and rooftops were littered with these aquatic creatures. One man was shocked to see 13 carp on and around his truck. Apparently, he stopped to count them. No one knows for sure where the bizarre rain came from, but the most popular theory claims that a powerful water spout picked up all these creatures. Then it carried them through the upper atmosphere and dropped the animals on the unsuspecting people below. And now, welcome to Abraham Lake in Canada. It's completely frozen. You step onto the transparent ice and look down at what lies beneath. No fish, just some mysterious frozen bubbles. They look like small clouds frozen in ice, or jellyfish who forgot to pack a winter jacket. There are thousands of these little bubbles made up of methane. But don't try to dig a hole in the ice to touch it. Methane is highly flammable. It's created by methane-producing bacteria that eats leaves, grass, insects, or any other organic stuff that gets into the lake. When the methane touches the frozen water, it turns into tens of thousands of frozen little balls. When the ice melts, they burst open and sizzle. Similar lakes can be found near some shores of the Arctic Ocean. There, the size of the bubbles can reach several times the size of hot air balloons. Beautiful for sure, but not exactly safe. The next shocking lake is in Indonesia, the island of Java. You come to a majestic volcano, overgrown with grass and trees. The volcano seems to be asleep, but smoke is pouring out of it. You climb to the summit. Exhausted, tired, sweaty, you're ready to cool off. Nice work, you made it to the top. You look into the mouth of the volcano. Hmm, no boiling lava, just a beautiful, bright, turquoise lake down there. It looks like an oasis. Perfect time for a refreshing dip. You run down and get ready to jump in. But that's not water, that's acid! Sulfurous gases get into the lake from under the volcano. The lake itself is full of metals. When the gases touch them, they form that beautiful turquoise water. I mean, acid. Better head back to the nearest village, rest, and come back at night when it's cooler. In the dark, the lake seems to glow. Right above it, you see light-filled, exploding little clouds. The sulfurous gases rise out of the lake, combine with the air, and flash bright blue. Still, don't get too close. The sea turns sinister red, and no living being can survive in it. Must be some dark magic. In fact, it's tiny algae that spread uncontrollably, giving the water this specific tint called the red tide. They have toxins that destroy sea mammals, birds, and turtles, as well as creatures that feed on them. For humans, contact with it ends in breathing problems or seafood poisoning. Sometimes even huge ships sink in the open seas for no visible reason. That reason is often the pockets of bubbles that underwater volcanoes produce even while they're sleeping. Those productive magma factories are hidden under 8,500 feet of water. When they wake up, they act just like land volcanoes, and they can cause destructive tsunamis. This tree looks like a bottle. No wonder it's called the bottle tree. It grows in Namibia and attracts many tourists. But don't get too close to the tree because it's one of the most dangerous on Earth. Milky juice flows inside the trunk. It's highly toxic to the human body. On the bright side, though, the trees have beautiful pink-white leaves with a red core. There's a tree growing in Western Australia that was once used as a prison. A cell for criminals existed inside the Boab prison tree for a long time. People were usually kept there temporarily, just for one night. After that, they were taken to their final destination. The prison was built more than 1,500 years ago and has been perfectly preserved to this day. Tourists visiting this place can sneak a peek inside. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Hello, distinguished guests, and welcome to Aquarium Bright. Here, you will get to see the most dangerous sea and ocean creatures. But don't let what I said mislead you. 
it's very well possible for you to come across one of these underwater animals during a walk on the beach. So take a look at them carefully now and you might just avoid a disaster. Is it fish or is it stone? What you're looking at is commonly known as the stonefish, but its fancier names include the Dornorn and the Sinansia. If you're into diving and observing the underwater, you might already have come across one without noticing. Its appearance makes it almost impossible to distinguish it from a real stone due to its gray coloration and mottled appearance. Especially if you're wearing fogged snorkel goggles, so you better pay attention because otherwise the consequences can be unfortunate since stonefish are the most venomous fish known. Although some types of stonefishes are known to live in rivers, and most of them